Hi, everybody. Hello. Hello. Speak up. Hello. Again. You sounded a bit faint. What? You sounded a bit faint. Uh, can you hear me now? Oh. Yes. How's that? Yes. Okay, thanks. And then there were six. <laughs> There's a couple of folks who uh, expressed they had some summer activities going on. Um, like Fred is traveling through Europe, I believe. And Terry mentioned that uh, she had guests visiting uh, during these next few weeks. So there may, there may be more. And uh, yeah. Have you heard from Kim? I know last time she wasn't mentioned as a I have not summer heard. excursion. So no, I, I haven't heard from her. her. Although she was, she expressed some irritation at the end of yeah. the, the the call two weeks ago. So maybe she's processing something. Something's moving through her. But Doug, you had offered to lead a meditation to start us off. Yeah, um, I'm not one to uh, perform guided meditations, uh, so this will be a, a first for me. So I hope. But it, it was sparked by when I woke up this morning. I I had stepped out outside. I was reading a book, um, enjoying the the sounds of nature, sounds of the world around me. And um, I noticed a, a light as I was reading, just a tiny little light and realized it was a firefly, but it, it wasn't moving. It was staying one spot. And typically, like if you're a kid at night, a long time ago, you'll remember that it'll be in one spot and then disappear and reappear somewhere else. But uh, this firefly was sitting in one spot. So it, it, it reminded me of what I was reading uh, with Arobindo, um, hallucinations or illusions, or maybe I was still in the dream world. But um, when I went closer, I realized it was uh, it was a spider gnawing on a, a firefly, and that it, it had reached the. It, it was not pulsating. The bioluminescence wasn't pulsating, so it was the, the solid bioluminescence uh, or constant because the spider was gnawing at that, the, what is it? The thorax, the, the tail end of the, the fireflies. So it's pretty interesting that for whatever reason sparked me to want to do this. So should we wait any longer? I have fond memories of fireflies from my childhood. It was always a mark of the summertime. And flickering lights in the nighttime. We would stay up uh, past dinner and hang out outside. And my folks would hang. We had a, a porch in front of our house, a little you know covered patio. So they would sit out out there. And sometimes my uncle and aunt would walk by, and or we'd go to their house. And people you know, would be out. 
And you have a little light shining behind you, Doug. <laughs> Looks like the sun is up. going down. <laughs> So is there, is there anyone in the waiting room? Uh, if not, I'll go ahead and get started. Let's start. All clear. All right. So for this guided meditation, I'll, um, I've got one of my kids' toys, a triangle bell. So I'll, I'll use that today. But um, we'll maybe do a, a minute of silence. I'll do the, the guided meditation. And then another minute after that to kind of gather our bearings, I suppose. So, let us begin. We are such stuff as dreams are made of, and our little life is rounded with a sleep. That's from The Tempest. Next quote is Proust. I was alarmed nevertheless by the thought that this dream had had the clarity of consciousness. By the same token, might consciousness have this the unreality of a dream. So we are approaching a turning point in the text. Uh, a turn towards the internal cosmos, the, the subliminal self. And Aurobindo says about the sub subliminal self that our subliminal self is not like our surface physical being, an outcome of the energy of the unconscious. It is a meeting place of the consciousness that emerges from below by evolution and the consciousness that has descended from above for involution. There is in it an inner mind an inner vital being of ourselves, an inner or subtle physical being larger than our outer being in nature. So Aurobindo takes us on a journey through our minds. The only way out is through, through our minds. The mind's framings and projections set in place towards this divine life project and are now approaching a full framework. So will we meet Aurobindo in this journey? Will the rubber meet the road? This, all that we see and hear, all that we sense, all that we know is reality, a reality. Yet, how is this possible? The words we read on the page, words we hear, our physical presence here, is it illusion, dream, hallucination? Imitation, vision, 
revelation or prophecy, creation through imagination. Now, open your eyes for a moment and take a look at yourself. And take a look at the others in the call, in this call. Now close your eyes again. And recall the words from the Isha Upanishad. It was in a couple chapters before. The simple phrase, he am I. He am I. She is he. We are you. I am myself. You are ourselves. We are one. I am that. I am, I am, I am. I am, 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 I am. Am I? Am I? Am I? Am I real? Am I here? Where am I? When am I? How did I get here? How did I get from here to there? There to here? How am I not myself? How am I not myself? How am I not myself? Am I my wiggling toes? My feet and shoes with sole? The rubber meeting the road? The tired tires driving forward again and again and again? Am I my legs, arms, hips and joints? the brain and its thinking game. This frame is the foundation, the, phys the physical chassis moving past us, helping the tired tires tirelessly move faster, move past us, mustering lustrous lusters lusting for stability. But must we? What happens when we stop fueling our bodies? Stop feeding the dragons, feeding our fears. Without fuel, the machine does not move. And mindful of faulty metaphors, let us not equate the mind with machine or mind as algorithm. Let us silence the mind. Take these words and slow them down. Without speed needs, we slow down. Without movement, we die. The illusory world dies, and we arise. We deny the day's demise. The world is no longer stable. Yet internally, we are forming a stability to balance upon the groundless. The stability of the mind becomes the reality. This mind is our instrument. The body, too, is our instrument. We are the plastic people with the big letter P. Plastering fantastic and spastic aerobatics upon other plastic people's bombastic masks, a task everlasting. I take my stable mind with me into any possible experience. I take my stable mind with me into any possible experience.
I take my stable mind with me into any possible experience. As Marco noted in the the introductory uh, thread or page that he made, that, that this was a quite the lengthy chapter, the second chapter that we focused on. Um, so I don't have much else to say at this point. I, I uh, thank you for giving me the space to try that out. Thank you. That was lovely. Thank you. Uh, that was great. <clears throat> I'm going to let Lauren in. She's been waiting for a few minutes. Hey, Lauren. We just finished a meditation that Doug guided us through. Want to test your mic? Or maybe she absconded for a moment. I really enjoyed that, Doug. Felt like it brought us into the first person perspective of the chapters. In the book I was taking outside to the, the fireflies called Dream Yoga. I've been going back and it's said by Andrew Holocek. Um, with a nice foreword by Ken Wilber, of course. Um, but the chapter I was reading was uh, the practice of illusory form. So it's it's um, it's very interesting how it all it's all tying together, at least for me, and how that tied in with uh, the the first of the cosmic illusion chapters there. And I, I've noticed too our conversations tend to, or maybe it's because it, Arabundo is covering everything, but. Um, before last session, we were focused on the ending of the call, focused on individual individualization. Um, and our last conversation was focused on dreams, which tied into this conversation. So wondering where we'll take this conversation. <laughs> I, I also like the tie back to Shakespeare. We don't, uh, we tend to, to stay in Aurobindo world and it's nice to have a link back to some of the other uh, sources. And Aurobindo loves Shakespeare. He writes about him quite a bit in, in future poetry. So 
I have a question for you, Matteo, um, which it was noted that the, the second chapter that were the reality and the cosmic illusion, it, it seems as much as I could gather, it seems like a lot of it is based on his reflections of the Upanishads, which I have not read. Um, I was wondering if you had any reflections on that chapter in particular, or maybe you can ground us what's going on there. That's a lengthy, lengthy chapter there. Yeah, there's definitely a lot of Kenna Upanishad in the second chapter, the reality and the cosmic illusion. There's cycles in the early part of the Kenna Upanishad that kind of put the chanter into the witness consciousness and the pattern is um, this repeated pattern of that which sees not with the eye that by which one sees the eye scenes know that to be the brahman and not this which men follow after here and it goes through that cycle with the senses the definition of kenna is by whom. And the kenna starts off with these amazing koans, by whom missioned falls the mind shot to its mark. By whom yoked moves the first life breath forward on its paths. By whom impelled is this word that men seek, that men speak, what God set eye and ear to their workings. And yeah, it's the, this, uh, the, the, it seems like Sri Aurobindo just keeps going over and over, brings us back to uh, all this is the Brahman, all Brahman exists in all of this and all of this is real. And I love this chapter because he, he doesn't set aside Buddhism. He, uh, he fully develops uh, the Buddhist, the Buddhistic perspective. And then there's a part that he goes into his own um, experience of Nirvana. I marked it out somewhere. It's so clear and, um, Oh, this chapter so long. Oh, uh, yeah. Uh, um, I have, just so you all know, I number the paragraphs because I have uh, four copies of the Life Divine in my house that have all different paginations. So page numbers really don't do anything. Um, but if you have the same as me, it's uh, page 486. If you are a nerd and number your paragraphs like me, it's a uh, paragraph 32. <laughs> uh, but this, uh, he, he dives into his own experience of Nirvana. I mean, wow, is it ever rich. And there's also echo, echoes of the Mundakya Upanishad in, in this specific section. Yeah. Uh, and he also touches on like, uh, uh, it's an interesting question of why isn't there, this isn't, this isn't a fair statement due to recent migration refugee patterns, but there's basically no Buddhism in India. And why, why is that? He gets into it and how Shankara completed Buddhism, I think in the, in the sixth century and, well, you know, there's a, a ton of Tibetan Buddhists in India at this point, but there's not a really uh, a, a his, much of a history of Buddhism left over in, in India. Buddhism is mostly north of India, except for that. But uh, yeah, I, I, there's no way that I can summarize any of this. It's just, it's so, uh, it's so rich and vast, other than he just kind of keeps, he keeps like churning at it getting into the, the, um, the human distortion being kind of the, the only real illusion being that of the separativity of consciousness. 
your meditation was lovely, Doug. Your meditation actually like works into, works through a number of the intuitions that he's, he's bringing us to in this. <clears throat> Matteo, what was the first line of the paragraph that you were? Deciding? Oh, good, good question. Let me, uh, let me say that might help. Um, 32 okay paragraph 32 and maybe my numbering's off but but this debate belongs to the domain of the pure reason and the final test of truths of this order is not reason but spiritual illumination verified by abiding fact of spirit and he brings us there in this very long paragraph and if you all want Poetry representation of this paragraph, Savitri, Book 7, the Book of Yoga, Canto 6, Nirvana and the Discovery of the All-Negating Absolute. Not only does he bring us there with that canto, but he works us through the different uh, methods of quieting the mind, the Raja Yoga method of negation, the Gita method of affirmation, and then Sri Aurobindo's method of actually like well, witness consciousness, observing the thoughts coming in to get to the silent mind, to get to the discovery of the soul, to get to nirvana, the nirvanic states, to expand out in the next canto after nirvana and the discovery of the all negating absolute is, uh, is uh, the, the cosmic spirit and cosmic consciousness. And the book of yoga in, in Savitri is Savitri's yoga. So it's kind of, it's later on before she, she goes through this yoga before she encounters and battles with death. <clears throat> did you find the paragraph, Marco? I think I did, yes. But it is the reason accustomed to deal. Is, is that the one that it began? But this debate belongs to the domain of the pure reason. Ah. Well, I have a bit of a high level schematic philosophical reading of these couple of chapters and although we were, they were long i'm glad that we grouped them together because the second one really completes the the first but my my understanding of them is that this is his response to or counter argument to the views particularly of shankara so advaita vedanta and then the buddha but in particular, I think what in Buddhism is referred to as Hinayana or Therav Theravadan Buddhism, which denies the reality of the relative self and um, or of a of a deity uh, and construes the ultimate reality as a, a nihil or, or an emptiness or a void. Uh, and Shankara being an advance on that, or at least in Aurobindo's view, uh, a refinement of that because it still construes the world as illusory, but grants reality to the individual within the world who then can undertake the, the sadhana or yoga of transcending it. But he's arguing that the, both of those views, while they have legitimacy insofar as they're expressions of spiritual experience, are not the most uh, complete or inclusive or comprehensive view, because he's saying that there's also this other experience which, uh, you know, can occur alternatively to or beyond uh, the the ones where the world appears to be illusory and the only reality appears to be the the Brahman or the you know the soul source or origin. There's another experience where that oneness, that Brahman, is also active and dynamic and creative. And so everything that we consider to be the world is real because it's an expression of that reality. And it's the mind that divides up the world into 
different things, objects uh, that then it you know places into various kinds of hierarchies of beings and various ways of organizing things, but that what's required is a supramental experience, an experience beyond the mind, which actually intuits, not just reasons, but intuits that dynamic oneness in its actual unfolding through one's own being. And I th- what, what, what I think is interesting from a philosophical perspective is that there are, there are um, uh, corollaries in later Buddhist thought that he may not really be including or responding to here. For in particular, the tantric um, Buddhism or or tantric uh, Vedanta or yoga, for that for that matter. I think he's arguing specifically, uh, um, not against, but in a way to round out or to to um, uh, give an alternative perspective on Shankara and and the kind of first phase or original Buddhism specifically. Uh, and so I was, I, I, I was reading it that way, um, as well as from this kind of first person sense, like, what do I really believe? Do I, do I believe that the world is illusory? It's a fairly common belief in a way. I mean, it's fairly common to hear the, the cliche life is a dream. And I think in pop psychology or pop philosophy, if we were just kind of to ask people like survey, like what do you, do you think life is a dream or is it real? We would get an interesting mix of answers, I think. And I, I find it, um, I find it compelling about these chapters that he's laying out a systematic kind of argument that life is not <laughs> just a, not just a dream. It could be like a dream, uh, but even that analogy breaks down the further you take it. And, and that gets into the details of, you know, of his arguments. Um, but I, I really appreciate this, art, the articulation of this perspective that grants reality to, to, in principle, infinite experiences. And even the experience of the divine being possible in infinite ways. And these particular Buddhistic or Advaita Vedantic or scientific materialist uh, ways of construing reality being only a few of infinite possible ways of experiencing the divine. So I, I think, um, I think I've, I actually read through all of it, uh, not too slowly, uh, because otherwise I wouldn't have made it. Uh, but I, um, I really appreciated like the argument and I appreciated the reasoning that, that went into it because I think it really uh, kind of exemplified or modeled that interface between the subliminal or the supermental and then the mental and the rational. I want to let others speak, but I completely agree with your uh, understanding of, uh, of him leaving aside modern Buddhism, because certainly modern Buddhism is a very diff- has taken on very different levels of understanding than I think were uh, present in the atmosphere 60 years ago. I, I so agree. And also other areas, like in psychology, um, things are very different. Cognitive psychology is quite dominant now. Psychoana- psychoanalysis he started to critique a little bit in the book. And also, you have to remember, you know, he really missed out on existentialism, structuralism, post-structuralism, Jimi Hendrix, you know, <laughs> he missed all of that, you know. And I have to remember that so that I can read this his- historically rather than, um, you know, project onto him uh, deficiencies in his worldview that, you know, he couldn't possibly have had. Um, so I think that working within those constraints, I think he's incredibly rich read. Um, I just wanted to share a little bit of how I'm trying to figure this out. The cosmic illusion chapter went well for me, the reality and the cosmic illusion, everything just seemed to fall apart. Um, but I, I did enjoy this part. Um, I'm quoting from, in my text is 433, The Cosmic Illusion. Our mind is an observer and user of actualities, 
a diviner or recipient of truths not yet known or actualized, a dealer in possibilities that mediate between the truth and actuality, but it has not the omniscience of an infinite consciousness. It is limited in knowledge and has to supplement its restricted knowledge by imagination and discovery. And skipping down, I, I just wanted to read at the bottom of this paragraph, in dealing with actualities, it may misobserve, misuse, miscreate. In dealing with possibilities, it may miscompose, miscombine, misapply, misplace. In its dealings with truth revealed to it, it may deform, misrepresent, disharmonize. It may also make constructions of its own, which have no correspondence with the things of actual existence, no potentiality of realization, no support from the truth behind them. But still these constructions start from an illegitimate extension of actualities, catch at unpermitted possibilities, or turn truths to an application which is not applicable. Mind creates, but it is not an original creator, not omniscient or omnipotent, not even an always efficient demiurge. So and there's a lot going on there. <laughs> and um, I think there's a difference, I think, between fantasy and reverie and illusion and the imagination and the imagine. Uh, I believe there are considerable overlaps. But I think when we're getting into the imaginal, we're, we're getting into something that's more objective than reverie, or just subjective, uh, you know, fucking around, <laughs> you know, basically with my, my fantasy life uh, or daydreaming. But that the, the, the imaginal has objective qualities to it. I just wanted to share a little sketch. This is extremely naive, and um, I'm I'm not quite sure what it's all about. But this is how this helps me. I don't know if you can see this. Can you see this? Okay. So A, A is rides a bike. Okay. B knows how to swim. C. has knowledge of these motor skills. This is objective, physical, and external. Someone can see me in the swimming pool. Someone could see me riding a bike, take a photo of it. Now then, then we look dealing with this, we have, okay, D can lucid dream. E can have out of body experiences. F is, a, is aware of psychic skills as access to D and E. But so C is dealing with the externals and this is all real. And when I'm swimming and when I'm, when I'm riding a bike, that's all first person. This is real. All of this is real to C. Lucid dreaming and out of body experiences, C does not have access to. So that would not be real to C. Now F has access to, to lucid dreaming and out of body experiences and other psychic psychic skills, but it's not aware. This doesn't this all what what's happening during the waking world, physical world, is um, not as concern. So these are different kinds of realities. Now G over here, and I hope you can see that has access to C and F and A, B, and D, E. So G has access to all of it. Now, so there are objective and subjective, and these are, these boundaries are very, very fluid for most of us. And most of it's happening outside of our awareness. So I could be riding my bike one day and thinking about a lucid dream I had the night before. So we can have these kind of hybrid states. Um, but the point I wanted to make was, I had an experience um, 
a very odd experience. A hallucin- I guess you would call it a hallucination. But um, I was asleep and I was in a lucid dream and hovering above me was a very frightening object. It, it had the quality of something that was animate and alive, but it looked like a, just a big, a big uh, paper bag. <clears throat> so it had no, it, it was alive, but it had no, nothing like that I'd ever seen. And I was appalled by it and I wanted to get a, go away. And uh, in my startled, I was so startled, I woke up in my physical bed and the scary image was still there. It was hovering in the corner of the room right next to my bed. And I got up, my physical body, I stood straight up and I punched it. <laughs> and, my, and my fists went right through it. It was totally transparent. It was only there for three or four seconds and it disappeared. So I, I think that in these kinds of states, this is a dramatic occurrence. And only one other occurrence like that has happened before where something from a, a subtle realm came into the physical realm. But even if it's only for a couple of seconds, and then the physical realm takes over and it gets very stable very fast. And that experience of the in-between, these kinds of hybrid states can become a realm of, uh, you know, fascination, terror, um, stories, ghost stories. Um, I think uh, all, for all of our, probably most of our folklore emerges from these kinds of experiences. And I don't think we should, um, dismiss them as irrelevant to our evolution. Um, but I also was aware there was a part of me that could handle um, the, the dream state, the lucid experiences, and that this um, image from a dream state came into the physical world, probably due to my suddenness, the suddenness of my coming out of the, the dream state into the physical state and carrying over that antagonism that I felt in the, in the dream state in the waking world. And I, and I, I swung at it and of course it, it wasn't in the physical. So it had no texture or no weight or no, nothing to, uh, to receive the blow. <clears throat> but I think these kinds of experiences too are very common. I think if the people are doing drugs, which I do not do for obvious reasons, <laughs> I don't need them. <laughs> Yeah, but I understand. I, I remember um, just a little anecdote. Um, who was that guy who did all those drugs? He was very famous. He died of a brain tumor. Do you guys know him? Cassidy. Oh, Cassidy. I don't know. Did Terrence McKenna? No. Terrence McKenna. Yeah. Just uh-huh. a charming story he told about. He would talk, talk about all his, his drug experiences. He said inevitably someone would come up after the and says, you know, I had those experiences too, but I don't, I don't do drugs. And he went, yeah, sure. And he said he was very skeptical of these people, but he said they always come up afterwards and hundreds and hundreds of people had made this claim. And he sort of, uh, sort of accepted that their persons and he thought they were extremely lucky could have these experiences without any drugs, but I don't consider necessarily lucky at all. I mean, it could be, it could be some people I think who, who may be unstable or who don't have an adequate ego um, could be, um, you know, quite uh, devastated by these kinds of experiences because they, they don't have a, a, a clear enough um, map of the world that, that, that allows them to be functional. So I, I think it can be a blessing, but it can also be a tremendous curse. So I'm just putting that out there because when we're talking about the imagination and uh, culture and the movies that we see, and the books that we read, and the music that we listen to, and all of these influences that are nefarious, and some of them are extremely beneficial. Um, but I think that um, it's, it's, it can be, very, it's, can be a very big challenge for all of us. But I think Arbindo is, I, I find him frustrating. I liked his first, the first chapter, the second chapter I felt was a little constipated. 
it just seems to be uh, really having a hard time finding for me an adequate vocabulary. Um, so that's why I sort of do the best I can with them. Um, you know, doing little mind maps and doodling and making little charts for myself so I can um, draw, drawing upon experiences that I've had that may have something to do with the text, but not quite. So I would really encourage people to, uh, if you're getting stuck, to just um, look at what you think you already know and then try to, out of what you, and then there's stuff that you don't know. And in between, there may be something that's, that fits. Um, so I'm just sharing with you some of my, um, my strategies for reading this text. So thank you for helping me figure this out. <clears throat> you know, I read this year, I read uh, um, The Ego Tunnel, The Ego Tunnel by Thomas Metzinger, this uh, neuroscientist. And um, in there he writes about out of body experiences. And he had one in his life and he said that there's a fraction of the population that has such experiences maybe 20 percent or so and our idea of um, a soul uh, maybe could come from those experiences so a lot of people have, have them maybe once in their life and um, in the west we have this idea of an you know, ghostly, etheric, out of body, um, you know, perception of ourself. And this could maybe come from those um, out of body experiences. You know, he has, he has this um, idea of a phenomenal self model. So you have a phenomenal self model in your head and you project it outwards and also uh, in your body. And uh, experiences um, where people who um, got their uh, hands cut, cut, uh, cut off um, and got stimulated by a rubber hand, and they, they feel the extension of their arm still, um, you know, still as part of their body, and um, uh, in this out of body experience. You know, this is basically what you do. You project the phenomenal self model outwards. Just wanted to add that. Well, it's only recently. I'm, I'm just this book, uh, Graham, Graham Nichols, How to Buy Experiences. He's a, a big researcher in this field. I posted um, a conversation he's having with. Rory McSweeney, who's a, an expert in lucid dreaming. And there's a different phenomenology. And we only know about, you know, this has all been confirmed in the laboratory. There are elaborate experiments. I think LaBerge was the person who made this famous. Um, I think it was, he was at Stanford, but he, he came up with a very um, ingenious test. Because before, people just said lucid, ex lucid experiences, out-of-body experiences, this is all just subjective. It's just nonsense. It's just your a vivid imagination. But he was able to, they were able to, de to detect when the person was uh, in them, um, their brainwaves were registering delta. And they knew they were asleep. And they had, um, and then they had, when they go into REM, there's a, a different rhythm more theta, delta. So they were able to look at the brain waves and they had established, pre-established a movement of the eyes, moving the eyes like this, back and forth in a certain rhythm, like three, three to the left or three to the right. And that would be the signal to the investigator who's looking at the EEG that uh, the subject was in a lucid dream. And so they were able to confirm this. Pre and also, there aren't that many signals you can offer to an investigator if you know there's a dream because your body's paralyzed except for your eyes. So I think this uh, opened up a whole new range of uh, exploration because now they, they couldn't just say this was just subjective because there was objective laboratory repeatable many, many times in, in independent laboratories. And the same thing is now happening for 
for uh, OBEs, out-of-body experiences, because there were many people said, oh, there's no such thing as out-of-body experience. It's just, a, it's just a lucid dream, right? Whereas 20 years before, they were saying there's no such lucid things as lucid dreams. But now, Nichols, they've done some experiments, and it seems to be that um, he has these out-of-body out experiences when he's in a waking state. And um, he's lying down, and his body is, is like in, in a comatose state. But he, uh, it, it's a form of, he's able to go to other places, physical places and non-physical places. I mean, pe many people have reported this kind of thing. It's a sort of a variation on, on remote dreaming, which is what the CIA was doing back in the, in the 80s and the 90s, with doing uh, espionage. So I'm just saying that... Um, I'm sorry, IA? Uh, uh, CIA. Oh, sorry. Uh -huh. Yeah, the CIA was doing um, remote viewing. They had a, a, they were funded by the, by the Pentagon, but they were doing espionage with it. And they were getting such reliable information. I think they kept it going for about 10 years. But, um, and they, um, but I'm just bringing all this up because I think our, deficient rational science tends to debunk and ignore these uh, latent capacities that we all have. And many of us, you know, because there's very little external evidence to support such experience, we'll just, and there's a great deal of uh, embarrassment and shame if you're exposed in certain settings. Um, I think this, this, I've mentioned before, this kind of cultural um, amnesia we impose on ourselves so that we don't have to deal with these anomalies um, that can, if we're unstable, you know, can, can create a great deal of instability. But if you have a stable enough personality, um, you can open up all kinds of research projects that are, I, I think, of great interest. Um, and I think would, uh, if enough people were able to develop these kinds of skills, could be moving towards an integral age or maybe an emergent age. I don't know what we're going to call this new age. Um, but I think science and the eso what has been esoteric would be less so. And I believe we might have a new normal, you know, where people would, you know, yeah, there's a dreaming out of body experiences, you know, other worlds, no big deal. <laughs> you know, we will have created these bridges between these, uh, these, um, these enormous divides, and these big splits in our, in our psyche and in our social worlds. So, knock on wood. <laughs> well, and and we, it's, it's the paradigm that elevates object, so-called objective knowledge above subjective knowledge. And he's Why? actually getting there in knowledge by identity and separative yeah, consciousness. That, that physical, yeah. physical only world, that's the only thing that's real. You're right. And and he's really answering. Uh, he's he's answering. He's answering the the zeitgeist of nineteen fourteen to nineteen forty to nineteen forty more or less. He's answering what was going on in consciousness at the time, and a lot of perhaps a lot of what's going on today may have been opened by these by these channels, not just Sri Aurobindo, but other channels that were helping these other other entities that were helping these channels open at the time. You know, but I think part of, in these chapters, these two specifically about the cosmic illusion and the reality, he's having a different argument than the one that I think you're pointing to, John. He mentions a little bit about sci scientific materialism as being one way he of- He didn't have access to any of this that I've just described. Well, I, I think for, experiments he didn't have the, the scientific experiments he didn't have. right, correct. But but I think for him, psychic phenomena and uh, yes. you know, all the kinds of things that you're talking about are taken for granted as, of course, that's real. that's that's, <laughs> that's what he's writing about, you know, exactly I, in very yeah. clumsy ways. I think it's, it's not crystal clear about what which realm he's in. You know? But but these days, like in our in our culture, American, Western, European-ish, modern, postmodern culture, people are not going around saying that the world is an illusion. Uh, you know, they are more fixated on the physical reality of the world. 
rather than it, its subtler or its um, trans- transcendent or transcendental aspects, which is what I, I hear you arguing for, that, that we need to have culturally uh, much more openness to a variety of kinds of experiences, not just physical experiences. I think we're, we're both at the same time. That's my view. We're imminent and transcendent. It's not an either or proposition for me. And I, cosmic. <laughs> I think that's, that's his, his view to, fits very naturally to me. I, I, don't, I have no real objections to, to what he's saying because I think in principle, even if he's not responding to postmodernism or deconstruction or et cetera, et cetera, in principle, like at the core of his philosophy is, I think, a, a radical openness to experience, to unlimited varieties of experience, and not just spiritual or what some people would call or in some contexts would be defined as spiritual experiences, but also the, the undivine and the profane and the ignorant. And he, I mean, he, it's so radically... Um, inclusive, I guess, in, in that sense, even if his particular manifestation is particular and doesn't include, you know, it's not, doesn't include the psychedelic revolution and all of the other things that have come into <laughs> culture and consciousness. Right. In the last right. 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 And those of us who've survived that, <laughs> we have a lot of extra uh, folk knowledge, I think, about those experiences to right. share. But I think also, I think that the psychic can be undivine. Um, I think that what the CIA was doing with the remote, div- remote viewing using those psychic powers was not divine. They were using it to overthrow foreign governments mm-hmm. and they succeeded. <laughs> Saddam Hussein said that the CIA was uh, psychically attacking him and they were, you know, he was right. Um, that's what I, and I think Aurobindo was investigating these psychic experiences because he was working against Hitler. So he was perhaps using his psychic gifts in a divine way, but there's no guarantee that there aren't those who can use their psychic gifts in quite undivine ways. Mm. That's another dimension. Mm. I just wanted to say something about the, can everyone hear me? Can anybody hear me? Hello? I, I hear you. Okay. Um, just, I, I just wanted to agree where, um, forget what, who was saying it, but believing that, you know, we're both like the material world and the spiritual world are very much both real and, um, can be experienced together. And I think it, Arbindo makes it very clear that you can't have one without the other, that it's a, a mutual you know, intertwining and a balance that is there. And um, I find it interesting that, you know, having the conversation doesn't always flow. Like we were saying how, you know, in the West, people here would say that the material world is what's real and deny the spiritual existence. And it's funny, I had um, a class with Joanna Macy at the California Institute of Integral Studies, and she had us talking kind of along these lines and um, <laughs> it was interesting because she just kind of made it seem like the only thing that was real Lauren, can you hear us? Lauren? So I suppose if you can hear it, Lauren, um, maybe step back inside. That might be a better connection. But um, the last thing that we heard was uh, the only thing she thought was real. But, well, super, we'll super auspicious. The CIA might have gotten her. <laughs> I told <don't know. laughs> I think what our best bet is if we can make ourselves indigestible to these larger psychic systems. They'll just like, oh, yuck, spit them out, you know. <laughs> They'll probably try to come back on it, hopefully. 
I did have something to say on, along the same line, so I'll, I'll stop myself if she does reappear. Um, but when online there was the discussion with reason, um, and I was staying out of the conversation because it was it was about this much higher than what I'm used to uh, communicating through words, at least. Um, but I I think Tony, you brought up. Oh, uh, hey, Lauren. Are you able to hear us? Uh, okay. So the last thing we heard was what she said or what she saw she, as reality. So if you want to start was, there. She was saying that the physical reality is pretty much all that's real. And, um, go upstairs. Um, and I came back with my response and um, she, funny enough, knew that I am into um, Ken Wilber, at least at the time. He was my big inspiration before I had even discovered Aurobindo. Um, and so I started trying to speak to the integral reality. And of course, we were there at the California Institute of Integral Studies. So you would think I could have a conversation about this with her. And uh, she just completely cut me off and started attacking me, actually. And at a certain point, I'm pretty sensitive, and I looked up to her a lot, and I started crying. And everybody in the room who was like a guru follower of Joanna's was just like, yeah, yeah, Joanna, you're right. <laughs> you know, and, and just kind of cutting me off and belittling what I had been saying. And I found it just so, like... It, I was taken aback by everybody's behavior in the class. And uh, she eventually somebody in the class looked at me and, or looked at Joanna. She's like, you know, Lauren's crying right now and nobody seems to acknowledge what's going on. And it was just really a, like an eye opener that, you know, not everyone is, is even open to having this discussion. And, and it was it was difficult for me because her whole perspective or i don't know if any of you are familiar with joanna macy and her work but she calls it the work that reconnects and it's about reconnecting our lives and our world and so she focuses a lot on the physical because it's about how we've harmed the earth and we want to live in a more harmonious way with the earth and we want to heal and use our our consciousness our ability to become one with the earth and feel the pain of it all um, in order to heal. And it just seems to make sense to say then that we are spiritual beings as well, that there's that side of things. And in order to really heal that divide we've created between us and, um, need to recognize both act and have an integration in our thoughts. That's all I have to say. <laughs> that's, that's not something I would expect from CIIS, or, well, maybe from the students, but not from a, a teacher. But that, that's one of the original reasons why I was turned away from Auroville was just hearing about simple bickering and financial issues and worldly issues. And so that, that kind of sparked like, well, what's, what's really true. Um, um, so yeah, thanks for sharing that. And I was going to try to tie in what Tony said about Metzinger and then my before I, I came to this site, before I started re-exploring um, the cyclical, the, the um, deeper realities, I suppose, the more subjective side of things. I, I wasn't a, a follower of Sam Harris or anything like that, but I, I liked a few of his ideas. And same with um, Yuval Noah Harari. And in a certain, I, I don't know if Harari would consider himself a materialist, but um so i had the question of like is it as a whole as where we are as a society it, um something i've been going back and forth which i don't as much 
go back to that materialist way of thinking. Um, but I guess is it better to reason from the top, like Aurobindo is doing, or 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 kind of go back to the material realm and say, this is what we know, this is what we see, this is what has been studied. And yeah, maybe in 50 years, um, lucid dreaming, out-of-body experiences, and um, actual change through the internal will occur. But um, for our current time, like what, what would be best? Like we told everybody to read The Life Divine and try, try out all this um, integral yoga. There, I, there'd be quite a few people that would uh, either not understand um, or turn away from it or, or reject it completely and see it as woo-woo or whatever phrase you'd like to use there. Um, so they, they kind of say we can appreciate this spiritual stuff as just, um, we, don't, we don't have to go into the, the spiritual stories, um, the, the part that we don't know is true. Um, kind of let the mystery be, perhaps. But um, so that, that's kind of a question that I, I grapple with at times. Not as much anymore, like I said, but um, it seems like for Harris, Harari, or even Metzinger, Metzinger, somebody like that, they, like, they're searching for what the best route, route is for like political, social, psychological. Um, so can we include the spiritual in our current society? This question has kind of come up multiple, multiple times. Then. So that's just something I'm grappling with. I don't know if we want to steer the conversation in that direction. So I'd like to, um, I haven't said much so far, um, partly because I'm behind on the reading, uh, uh, but I also, I wanted to listen more. Um, so in the opening quotation before this chapter on the cosmic illusion, the quotation from the Upanishads, uh, it has this thing, there are two planes of this conscious being, this and the other worlds, a third state is their place of joining, the state of dream, and when he stands in this place of their joining, he sees both planes of his existence, which is, I think, the G that you were, you were talking about, Johnny, in your diagram, right? Um, and I do like this, um, understanding of dream as being intermediate in some sense between the everyday reality that we experience and the spiritual reality that we're talking about here. Um, and I also appreciate your discussion, Johnny, of the, you know, and it's not just this um, session, but many other sessions where you talk about out of the body experiences and lucid dreaming and some of these things. However, I do have to say that I am of two minds about these things. I am a scientist and I have trouble with the evidence for it. And I think that the, and it, you, talk, you talk about it as the subtle realm. And I think part of the problem with the evidence is that it's hard to get evidence in the scientific sense about the subtle realm. I mean, the, the, the early experience on telepathy had got into trouble with it because it was very hard to get repetitive results from telepathy because uh, you turned around and you, you, you provided information to people and all of a sudden um, the results were no longer reproducible. And so... It depended on who was doing the experiment. And of course, in science, that doesn't count. If, if, if it depends on who's doing the experiment, that's not considered sufficient evidence for the... So I haven't read the other, the other papers that you're citing, Johnny. Um, I can and, post and Yeah, okay. This, this um, is I mean, literature on this. I, I'm not sure I will read it all because, you know, it's... It's another whole problem to do that. And it's not necessarily where my interests lie. But I do want to get to put it out there that although I'm not entirely convinced from a scientific perspective that these things exist in a kind of um, reproducible, clear way, 
I have had experiences with these alternative, with the subtle realm, if you want to call it that, or if I want to call it that. So I have experiences of the kind you're talking about, maybe not out of body experiences, but I have, when I go to bed at night, I wake up in the night and I hear two teams of people arguing over about over my destiny and one of the, some of them is, are, are are arguing for continuing to let me to live and others are arguing to to have me you know put to death in some way and it's a very uncomfortable thing to experience and if i wasn't as you say so stable in my own personality I, you know, it's a kind of hallucinatory experience that would be extremely difficult to live with. Uh, and so, but, you know, but is I have... That real? Is that real? I don't know whether that's real. I mean, those are some of my questions. I mean, is that a dream, a waking dream, or is that a hallucination? Or is that something real that's actually going on and I'm tapping into? I don't know. Did that happen, though? Did it happen? The experience you just what, described, that these, two, that yes. these voices you hear while you're asleep. It happens every night. Okay, so it really happens. Yes. What the status of it is, you're unsure of, but that it happens, you are sure yeah. of. Okay, that's yes. very important to clarify. Yeah. When we're talking about illusion. So even though I... Yeah. Sorry, Dan. Yeah, so even though I have doubts about the phys the science of this, in my own personal life, I'm quite aware that there exist these other realms if, or whatever you want to call it. And there has to be some sort of an explanation for it. And, and, and so how I connect the pieces, I don't have the answers. I just have the questions. Uh, but I remain open to talking about them. Like Lauren was saying, I think the idea that you cut off the discussion uh, because you don't even want to look at the question is uh, is totally the wrong way to go. You should be open to, you know, bringing the discussion forward and talking about the fors and against and forming an opinion as you go. And maybe not knowing the answer, maybe not knowing the answer is part of it, you know, so. Uh, but I do think that this uh, insight from the Upanishads, well, the Upanishads, the version that I have is Aurobindo's translation, I guess. So. <laughs> when you say the Upanishads, it's kind of Aurobindo in, <laughs> in, a, in a kind of way. Um, you know, this idea that uh, the dream world is halfway between the two, or, or in some sense intermediate between the two realms, is something that I find compelling, I guess is what I would say. Did you read the first chapter, Jeffrey? I didn't read it all. I read about uh, a third of it. As I said, I'm a bit behind. I might, I might have read it wrong, but I think he does get into exactly what you're talking about there. By he goes through dream, hallucination, um, and then brings in imagination. And in a way, I, I can't explain it, but. Um, if you do get to the end of the chapter, it might give you a few answers there. To okay. It'll give me more motivation to finish the chapter. Yeah. <laughs> uh, so I, I, I also wanted to add, add uh, just sorry, just before I, I finish up, I just wanted to add that I'm having trouble reading Aurobindo. It's part of the reason why I'm behind. It's hard for me to motivate. I have, I have as you all know, and many of you know, many reading projects that are running parallel to each other. And out of all the reading projects I've got, I find the motivation to read the Aurobindo chapters for these sessions the most difficult to deal with. Um, there, there's such a barrage of words uh, that I, I find it really difficult to get through them. So I'm still motivated because there are long-term interest that I have in Aurobindo and I'm still going to keep plugging it away at it and also I have to say the last two weeks I've been very busy with some things uh, some work for the university that uh, took over pretty well all the time I had extra 
Uh, and so that's part of the reason why I'm behind. But I am finding it difficult to read the text. So I, uh, and I'm not, I'm not sure I can fully articulate why, but, but it, it, I, I find it a real challenge to read. Do you like poetry, Jeffrey? I do, and I liked the bit of Savitri that I, that I read at the beginning, but I haven't There's, really had a chance to go back to it. If you're interested in sort of a poetic formulation of this, uh, the, uh, an articulation between these different states, uh, Book 11 of Savitri, uh, um, you could Google a line. I don't have the page reference, with, but it, it's, a, it's a section that starts with the line, Virat. Lighting, fi- lighting campfires in the suns. And Virat is the Vedic god that represents waking consciousness. And then there's a whole, the whole next section is uh, Hiranya Garba. And she, he represents um, the dream consciousness. And he kind of folds these, these different states of consciousness. He, he walks us in, in poetic mantra, he walks us through the same things that he's walking us through, the same four states that he's walking us through here. And it may, I don't know, you may have a higher affinity to that writing than the prose writing here. Okay, I'd have to get over my obsession to read stuff at every, any text in order. <laughs> oh yeah because book 11 the second to the last book good good 20 you'll you'll be there in twenty three thousand lines <laughs> so i'll have to skip over to get it and so that's that's another part of my obsessions that i'll have to deal with but <laughs> <laughs> i can't help with that jeffrey <laughs> I had a thought in response to Joanna Macy's um, response to you. Yes, I see you earlier. Uh, you know, we're talking out of body experiences. <laughs> you're, you're breaking up. You're, And somebody, I think, mentioned past lives and whether or not it's... So I've had plenty of, of out-of-body experiences, a handful of them, and um, a few past life experiences. They were all connected to the same lifetime, uh, just like different details of it coming in. Uh, 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 different experiences. Lauren, and, could you try without video? Lauren, you know, could you try without I video? More like, well, is that real or are you just making that up, you know, without the video? It might help with bandwidth. I don't think you're, I, I don't hear much. I kind of, I can't catch the thread of what you're saying, only barely. I'm I'm gonna I'm trying to stop her video from the admin end. So let's see if that works. Uh, I do have some reflections on what she shared, and uh, you know maybe can fill in. Yeah. Uh, can you can you hear me? Oh yes. Yes. Uh, so we we haven't. You've been kind of cutting out the last couple minutes. Uh, You're talking about out of body experience and reincarnation or something, Lauren. We heard a little of that. And you can keep going. I, I, I stopped your video, and I think that might help. Yeah. Okay. So we can hear you now. Okay. Cool. Awesome. Okay. Um, <laughs> I should be in better reception area now. Um, yeah. So I was just saying... I'm having a flashback right now. This is tripping me out. <laughs> if anybody is on LSD right now, this <laughs> uh, may sound interesting. 
Um, so Lauren, you're, you, you keep cutting out. Can you hear me? Ack. All right. I, I would like to try to say something because we focused on scientific materialism as being one of the forces. Oops. You there? Yeah. We, you keep cutting out. I know. I'm sorry, you guys. So, um, anyways, for me, it's like if it provides some sort of meaning and like deepens your experience of reality and is maybe even healing for you in some way, then it's real. You know, if, if it gives you something out of life to me, it's real. And again, I can say, well, it could easily be my imagination and, and I'm willing to have both of those like held together as possibilities. And it, for me, my past life experiences have provided a lot of healing and meaning. So, and same with my out of body experiences, they've been incredible just to, to be able to witness myself, um, not necessarily separate from my body. I was actually like one of my most profound moments was when I was at UC Santa Cruz for the first time and thinking about going to school there and uh I got out onto this knoll where I could overlook all of Santa Cruz and I just suddenly had this feeling of being outside of my body but not completely outside of it it was almost more like I was one with everything around me and particularly Santa Cruz and like the people and everything there the forests that school and I had this very clear voice tell me that I was going to be there for the next four or five or more years of my life. And I was there for 10 years. Um, so, and that was extremely real. You know, there was nothing not real about that. That was the only UC I got into. I applied to a few schools, but that's where I ended up going. And so. So, um, I, I wanted to respond to, Joanna Macy's comments to, to you um, because I'm, I, I read some of her work a long time ago and I have a sense of it and uh, I know that you know she's very respected in the environmental community, uh, deep ecology. Um, she's an activist and you know she expresses great care and concern for the state of the planet and for you know, real remorse, I think, and a sense of tragedy for, you know, what's been done to this natural and divine bounty, right, that, that we've been given. But I do think that your experience highlights another source of the reductionism that I think Aurobindo is arguing against and John often argues against. And we sometimes look at that from the perspective of scientific materialism or scientism not to say, you know, good, good, healthy science, but I think it also can come from the activist uh, mindset and the activist idea, uh, per particularly when, you know, we get into, like, you know, misery loves company. <laughs> and if, if the pattern of your relationship to reality is that it's all fundamentally ruined in some way, it's all um, degrading in some way. And that is the predominant sense of what's happening. And there isn't the perspective, which I think you get in dream, out of body, psychedelic, spiritual, and other kind of experiences of infinity. This world is just one world of infinite worlds. This earth is, is, one, is, is one planet amongst billions, trillions, infinite planets. Uh, and I, and I, and I think when one can access those perspectives, it's not that you don't care anymore. I think you can care even more deeply, but I don't think you're limited to that, to the, the, the only tragic and the only um, um, unhappy uh, sense of what's going on. I think that you could be happy even in the, even in the, um, you know, even in the midst of, of what's a really critical and a tragic situation. And I mean, perhaps part of what 
you were arguing for in that class, Lauren, I'm, if you still, still can hear me, uh, is just the possibility of other kinds of experiences, not the one kind of tragic experience of, you know, that has a narrative already built into it. Maybe you were experiencing a sense of the infinite potentiality of narratives and, and um, ways of, uh, of relating. So um, I think it's sad that you had that, you know, happen to you, uh, particularly, you know, in that location. But I, uh, myself, I would like to start from the perspective of, of allowing for that diversity of experience. Uh, first of all, like, what if that was the starting point and we didn't um, have to fight these battles uh, against narrower or more constraining views? I mean, what if we just presumed that that's not you know, that, that that's not reality? That's not the whole reality. That's a partial reality. There is something important, true, meaningful about the the perspectives of scientific materialism or um, earth activism or what have you, but there is much more that we can experience and draw on even in our earthly uh, transactions and activism and, and being with others. I think the starting point is really important. And I th to me, this is the, the theme of this whole reading has been about starting points because Aurobindo has, a, I, I want to say, a different, a fundamentally different starting point than um, certainly than our own predominant culture, uh, but also than many other thinkers that I'm aware of. And I think getting that, like what he's drawing from or what he's conveying makes the reading easier too. Je Jeffrey, I've, I've felt like if I could just follow his argument, because I think he's making arguments that are grounded in a particular intuition that he's expressing, um, I find it easier to get through because it, it certainly is a, a lot of words. <laughs> it definitely is a lot of words. Uh, and I've been trying to find a, 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 about three lines in Nietzsche where he says everything that is said in these two chapters in three lines. Um, he's, and I, I'm, not, I'm not able to find the, the quote, but I'm going to dig it up and post it uh, because it, it's basically about reality and appearance. Uh, you know, he, the, the idea that you know, we've posited a real world and an apparent world. And then we discover that the apparent world is unreal. And then because the real world has been posited from within this apparent world, it becomes unreal and you end up in nihilism. So the only way out of that is to re-allow for both the apparent and the real worlds to be real. That's essentially in a nutshell what this whole chapter is about. Um, and uh, so I, I think, yeah, of course, like, why should we, um, you know, continue to uh, feed these views, which are, you know, which would, which would offer a, a much more limited reality, a much more li limited sense of possibility. I mean, why not just presume, presume the starting point that gives you the most ultimate freedom to have experiences. Um, it does seem to me, though, that um, now I'm I'm going to argue against Aurobindo here, but it doesn't mean to say I'm against him. It's just a, a part of my own thinking about this. But Aurobindo is trying to create a consistent understanding of the spiritual life. I'm not convinced that what we need, what humanity needs, is a consistent understanding of spirituality. I think we need inconsistent understandings of reality. I think we need to accept that human beings contradict each other in different places and that some of those contradictions are useful and valuable. So in my own personal understanding, I don't, I'm not that interested in trying to argue why Buddhism is not as complete as some other religion, as some other approach. Buddhism is what it is and what it says, and it, it has its own value. 
it's not consistent with another approach. But I don't think consistency is what we should be necessarily looking for. And Aurobindo is trying to find consistency. That's part of the whole argument that he's developing. So it's the caveat I have reading Aurobindo, I think, as an effort to create a consistent integral vision. It's extraordinary. But provided you accept that a consistent integral philosophy is what you're after, and that's where I have some difficulty. I think Sri Aurobindo would agree with you, Jeffrey, except for the fact that he's trying to create a consistent grounding for this. It's, uh, yeah, that's, I, I, I wouldn't know where to begin with that. I don't, I don't, yeah, I, I don't agree with that, but I agree with everything else you said, except for that starting point. I just don't, I don't see that with Sri Aurobindo, but it's because I've read almost, everything that's available and i i think i have uh maybe a little bit wider picture than this one philosophical work that he's uh presenting i think it's very noble to think it all together and although various pictures don't fit we need something like this especially now so um there aren't many people who have this real drive and do this move of um, living in different cultures and then are capable of thinking it all together. And I think there are some people who would um, see this as a little bit of an oppressive move, but um, you know, you can have a re relationship to those bigger pictures that he offers that you know, maybe that this is something that we could step into in the future. So um, even though it doesn't fit all together, maybe, um, you know, in order to create, let's say, um, a more united world where uh, aspects of uh, uh, several cultures don't fit, we need a bigger picture. And I think there are many people who would think of this as a bad thing. So, um, but um, I think this is a very rare uh, project to think it all together and um, it's important. You need someone to do it. Although it's maybe oppressive to uh, uh, some people who would say, yes, I mean, my culture, my uh, my conception, maybe um, you know, isn't as much valued. Mm, we need a world, a world philosophy of some kind. Maybe not strict, but just uh, as a hypothesis out there. He starts off synthesis of yoga in chapter one or two, quoting Swami Vivekananda saying that humanity will have evolved to the next level when each individual has their own religion. I'm paraphrasing, but it's like he's looking for the shortest possible path to that, to the, the sovereign fully embodied, real self individual that's a manifestation of all the, that's a manifestation of the cosmic and the transcendent. And that's, uh, if there's consistency in that, then, <clears throat> then perhaps he's guilty, but that's, uh, so, so what was the as far as a oh, synthesis of yoga. Okay. Yeah which is kind of like what the, <clears throat> the how of integral yoga, the life divine is the why of, in, of integral yoga, but synthesis is the how. Yeah, and I don't remember, it's either chapter one, two or three, somewhere early on. <clears throat> also the uh, beginnings of that argument uh, in the synthesis of yoga is a chapter called the, um, the three steps of nature. 
saying that nature has brought us this far. It's time for consciousness to actually take over. And humans are the beginnings of consciousness collaborating with the divine. <clears throat> Thank you. Well, I, I really appreciate it, Jeffrey. You mentioned um, about um, spirituality and and trying to come up with like a, some sort of coherent spirituality. And maybe we should let go of that and just appreciate the plurality of uh, many of these traditions, and maybe there are new traditions that are going to emerge. Um, but I also think we should give up trying to unify physics. I think um, a lot of that is, if you're going to, I think we asking, how does consciousness emerge from matter? I mean, the, the, the materialist eliminative, they, they want to eliminate consciousness. There's some materialists who do and just say, it's just a epiphenomena, it's just an illusion. It's just, it doesn't exist. But I think the question of how can you reduce something like consciousness to something like matter, when it doesn't seem to be there's a big consensus on what matter is. It seems to me, I don't use the word spiritual because it's just too ephemeral for me, but matter seems to me equally ephemeral. I think, it, I can't remember who said it's like, we're, we're floating on, um, on just a wave of the undefinable. And, you know, consciousness as it gets more and more complex with this super string theory and, come, and it seems like one narrative after another narrative starts to come up to try to, to justify this uh, peekaboo game it seems they'd be big playing. I just don't, I don't know the physics. I agree. I don't know science is what kind of science and which science should we be focusing on? Um, when we're, we're talking about consciousness, but I don't think it should be physics. Well, I what agree, can... Johnny. I think 99% of scientists would be shocked at what I'm saying because science yeah. is based on the idea that the universe is one consistent entity and you have to seek the explanation for it. Now, it's true that science as it's practiced is full of contradictions, but all of the contradictions are understood as being partial truths trying to get at the one truth what, what i'm well, saying is i don't think there is one truth i think it's divided up into different different i, I, I would agree i think there's spirit there's there's science as knowledge and then there's science as practice and science as practice is all over the place i think you could say the same thing about spirituality Spiritual, spiritual practices, there are thousands of them, and they have very different kinds of results. So I, I'm sort of wanting to just sort of give up on this idea that uh, we're going to unify everything, the unified it, it, ideal theory, and everything will be taken care of. I just think it, we're much too complex for that. And I also think it's related to our argument about certainty. I mean, we want everything to be certain. So this idea that there's one universe and one truth is also an argument about, well, you can be certain about these things. And uh, in the 21st century, 20th century, leading into the 21st century, one of the things we've learned to be is distrustful of certainties because uh, life with its certainties becomes tyrannical. Uh, I mean, the, 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 the power structures that... Uh, oppressed people are all based on certainties and it's the uncertainties where life can exist in the in a certain world life doesn't even exist it, it only exists when there's possibilities for change and new things to emerge if everything was certain there would be no place for new things to emerge and so um so i think part of the argument is is against certainty as well well i think that the kind science that wants to control and wants to predict and wants to repeat is, is not the kind of science that's going to open up, I think, any, anything useful about consciousness or the mind. <laughs> I think that um, the search for laws comes out of a need to 
quantification, I think Bateson said, leads to laws, formulation of laws. What's the same, what's repeatable, what's regular. And he was very interested in differences and differences that make a difference. And that tends to lead our attention to qualities. And I, I think that's a, a different kind of study. And I think you can study qualities. I think that can be approached in a scientific way. I think this was Goethe's inspiration. And um, when he worked with plants and he worked with botany, morphology, worked with optics, um, he just had a very different way of thinking about science. And it wasn't this kind of Newtonian, uh, rigid billiard balls bumping up against each other kind of science. So, but I'm, I'm pretty sure a hundred years from now, science will be thinking differently than the way we're thinking about science. And maybe a, this kind of qualitative uh, approach to Goethe inspired many people to think about. It hasn't caught on, but I think there are enough people who have been interested in it um, that they, uh, you know, could become partners with those who are in the arts and those who are studying sociology and psychology um, so that we can open up all these fields. But I think that, that we, anyway, that's my spiel about s similarities, differences, and the same. Um, I think that there may be something that unifies all of them, uh, that we can sort of intuit in these, you know, expanded or altered states of consciousness. We can sense something that's very grand and larger than all of us, that's holding all of this together, but that vanishes very quickly. You know, you have to uh, deal with the physical world, chopping wood and carry water. So anyway, that's my spiel. But I'm just saying when, when, I, when people, truth and reality drive me crazy when people start talking about truth and reality. Because um, I think reality is going to be very different it depends on where, where you're, where the, where is the perceiver? Where, where are you perceiving this reality from? Like I tried to explain in that experience when I had a lucid dream and that it, figure scared me and I woke up in my physical body and the figure was still there in the physical room. There had been something that came, that carried, a feeling that carried across from one reality to another reality. But I say both of them are real. I w I'm not privileging one or the other, but I think that it, there has to be some organizing principle so that my personality doesn't fragment, but that I can go through these different um, reality frames and maintain coherence. And that takes practice. And I don't think it's for everybody, but I spent a lot of time working on this stuff simply because I had such weird things happen to me. I didn't invite them. I didn't even want them. And I looked, asked around, is anyone having these experiences? Very few people were, but the ones who were, I thought, you know, I, I studied with some of them and I read all their shit and tried to figure it out. And I don't think we've, we've come anywhere close to having anything like that, a unified theory of this stuff. But I don't want to be intimidated by the material um, because I feel like so many people are leaving so much out and then they're, and then they're talking about reality. I just get very like antsy when I hear that stuff because there's reality, there's the actual, there's the possible, there's constructed images, there's actual memories, but every memory is a, to some extent, a creative act. We make up our memories. There's no like storage place where the memory has been recorded. So I think we're in a very fragile kind of uh, state right now. We're moving between all these theories and none of them are making a whole lot of sense to me. But I keep per persevering. So thank you for listening to my rant. <laughs> it's very confusing. I appreciate everyone's sharing. I, I don't like leaving early. I just every other Thursday, I have a two-hour board meeting from seven to nine. So I have to scoot. But I'm glad. Uh, wow. I mean, just really tender, honest sharing. I appreciate that. And I uh, love everyone's, I love hearing everyone's perspective and opinions on this. It's uh, it creates a beauty and diversity. Anyway, I'll, I'll see you all. Um, I'll see you all next Thursday. It's always great to have you, Matteo. You, you, you contribute such a lot to the discussion. 
It's mm. a pleasure to have you here. And Thank you. It's appreciated. Thank you very much. Yeah, likewise. And and I just, yeah, I think this, I look forward to this every Thursday. So I'll see you all next week. Mm. Au revoir. Well, Aurobindo does argue and say that reality is individual, not only individual, but that the individual or individual experience is real. And the mind, he argues in this text, uh, partly correctly construes and partly misconstrues that experience because it's a mix. It has this capacity to take things, bits of that are based on reality and then recombine them, remix them, project them. But he does say that the mind, which I think applies also to the scientific mind, is inherently wants to improve. It wants to get a better view. It wants to clarify. It, it doesn't want to wallow in confusion. Uh, and insofar as there is an evolutionary movement, or impulse, force, direction to the cosmos and to the individual as arising in the cos within the cosmos, the mind is trying to get better pictures, better representations, at least, of of reality. And and that's the doubting that the 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 play between certainty and uncertainty is an aspect of mind. Uh, and I think Aurobindo does want to be intellectually consistent. I think that that's one of his strengths is his intellectual, conceptual, rational consistency. I could follow his arguments and they make sense to me. Uh, and, but, but he also is very clear to state that there's a difference between reason based on finite um, forms and the reason that is um, uh, articulating experiences of an infinite nature. And those are not totally different realms. There is a flow between them. This is part of his theory of involution and evolution. But I think that there, there is a difference. And so part of, I think, sharing our weird experiences there's value in that just because whether whatever the truth status of them is from the perspective of mind, the fact that they happened is indisputable. And then we can work out what they mean. But having that spaciousness of consciousness to be able to allow for that multiplicity of experience is, I think, part of what consistency actually gives you. Because there's a sort of meta consistency that is the radical tolerance for diversity of experience. And that, that meta consistency, I would argue, is also part of the stability that Doug intoned at the beginning of this talk. Like, the craziest shit could be happening, right? And uh, har psychedelic experiences can be harrowing, they could be utterly terrifying. Uh, and one has to find the aspect of oneself that is not those experiences, that is aware of them, that uh, is having them, but that is not exactly the same as them. And, and that's the aspect, I think, where, you know, as Aurobindo says, that you're fading from overmind, supermind, you're at the, you know, the portal because there's some there's a there's a meta consistency i think uh and i um i also rebel against the impulse toward a theory of everything whether it's materialist or integralist i think that from an aesthetic perspective i'm i i don't resonate with with those kinds of approaches because they tend to formalize and systematize and the intentions are good but i think that that mode of thinking, that mode of constructing reality according to a system, according to a kind of bounded set of constraints or a hierarchy or an ontology or what have you, uh, I think it, as much as it opens up space, 
it also becomes its own kind of amnesia and its own kind of ignorance, literally ignoring the littler things that maybe don't fit in the big theory or aren't really captured, you know, in the concepts. And that's more like the minor gesture kind of stuff. And I think more the poetics, quantum, cosmic field, whatever kind of poetics, um, you know, like, and that's all I, want, I think I want to say. I, I don't, I don't want to, I mean, I think that, for example, just poetically, a lot is different has happened even from, you know, we talk about the poetic side of Aurobindo and Savitri and so forth, but uh, there's very different kinds of poetics than this cosmic, you know, um, mythic, uh, grand kind of uh, state um, writing. I think we should have a different a different relationship to big picture theories. It's not that they are necessarily repressive and um, it's good to think uh, the commonalities of the different scientific disciplines together in an interdisciplinary way and not to reduce um you know the particularities and um you know in terms of something like uh john davis said those out of body experiences and first person experiences the problem with those is that we just never could agree on those you know collectively and it's just <laughs> you know we, we will never agree on first person experiences there can't be a newton of the grass play so there can't be a scientific theory of subjectivity. It's a little bit of a it's a little bit of a hurdle for something like this. So I didn't mean to imply that uh, uh, when I said that uh, I was sort of against uh, consistency, which is partially true, I guess, but. Uh, <laughs> I mean, obviously, I'm a guy who likes things organized as well, so I can't be completely against consistency. I, I just like a measure of inconsistency inside a consistent approach, right? So, um, and I didn't mean to imply that I thought that consistent systems were always repressive. I know I said some things about that, but uh, um, I think certain kinds of Consistent systems can be repressive, but not necessarily perhaps all of them. Um, I did want to say that, oh, I wanted to say that Bateson had some very interesting things to say about the way one constructs these systems and understanding, because systems, like if we go back to the logics that we looked at in another cafe and the different kinds of logics, and you can have, you know, logics are based on a set of assumptions and, and then you derive different statements that are true or false according to that particular logic. But you can have different logics, and different logics will give you different sets of true and false statements. And, so, and in some cases, one system of logic will give you true statements that are considered false in a different system of logic. So you have those kinds of inconsistencies across different logics. And Bateson talked about this idea of what-if games. So the idea is if you have a, a worldview or something that is different from your own, you adopt a what-if approach. You say, well, what if I accepted the postulates of this worldview, even though in reality I don't? What if I did? What would be the consequences of doing so? And as an exercise it allows you to go into a worldview that is different from your own and make sense out of the logical and the consistencies that are going on. And then come back to your own worldview with that experience behind you, and that may cause you to update or modify some of your own worldview as a result of having done that, that process. So I do find that's a useful way to deal with um, inconsistencies across different systems, if you like. 
And I accept, uh, Matteo said that, and you, Marco, also talked about this idea that Aurobindo is interested in, you said, religion for each person. I think it was maybe him that said that. I can't remember between the two of you. Um, but I think, you know, I'm open to those ideas in Aurobindo. I haven't, maybe I, I still need to read. <laughs> the relevant sections in order because you have to admit there's a lot of words in order to pull out these little nuggets. <laughs> so I will try and work harder at the reading. <laughs> Power through it. That's it. Just want to say I, I missed the recordings that were available for the first first book by um, whoever the, the lady is, but brought up on. Yeah, she she guided me through the first part. And now now I'm having to actually read the book. <laughs> so I'm I'm pretty tired. I, I'm not. That's those are my last words. I'll just say the last words that I, I, I think that what if that's very powerful. And now that I think about how I've read this, it's been that way. It's been to look at what I think the assumptions, what I think our windows like central assumption is. And what if that was true? And I take that on as a belief, at least while I'm reading. And I find that that is to the extent that I could tune into it because I have to feel it too. Uh, and if I'm not feeling it, it could be hard. And when I was this last bit of reading, I read maybe 30 pages or so, and then I fell asleep. It just knocked me out. And <laughs> I slept for a couple of hours and felt refreshed. Uh, but uh, I think that that's a, that's a powerful way to read. And, um, and it lets the text, in a way, perform itself through you. You're almost an, an actor of the text. And so thanks for sharing that. And I'll also wish everyone a good night. Uh, although I'll listen to any final comments too. Thank you. Well, I think that was a great way to end, but I think what all these, these A, B, C, D, E, G, these are different kinds of spaces that have a certain kind of affective tone and a certain, certain kinds of intensities. But I think as you move around these different spaces, there is sort of an imprint that each of these spaces have on, I think, a psychic being. And I believe that psychic being can coordinate much more efficiently than can the ego that we've all been trained to use and rely upon. So I think that's the challenge for myself. And I think our culture to some extent is to be very aware of these, these uh, tuning into these affective, affectively to these fields, which I think we're all, we're all experimenting with here. And I think we should be uh, grateful to each other for making this opportunity possible. Because I think it does stabilize a, a great deal that's going on if we continue this practice. Thank you. I do agree that listening to everybody talk about the text helps me to read it when I go back to reading it. I mean, it completely changes what I'm reading in a way. It changes how I understand things. So it's extremely useful to do. Um, also, this is my second video session tonight. I had an earlier session with Heather on quantum poetics. So I'm also quite tired having worked my through, way through very different fields <laughs> to get to this point. So I'm ready to call it quits too. <laughs> Sweet dreams, everybody. See you next time. Bye. Good night. Bye Good morning, Tony. Bye-bye. <laughs> See you later, Lauren. Thanks for sharing. Thank you. Sorry about the cutting off. Next time. All right. Ciao.